Delighted to be joined by Oluwashina Okeleje of the BBC to discuss the African participants at World Cup 2022. Oluwashina, how are you? I'm very well, thank you very much. Um, a strange World Cup, but hey, it's a World Cup after all. It is a strange World Cup. Uh, what are your own personal thoughts on it? <laughs> Should this be happening? Is this a complete uh, abomination? Well, it's taken how many years? Over, te over 10 years um, for us to get here. I mean, the World Cup was awarded a long time ago. Um, people kept talking about the, you know, the, the, the situation in Qatar, from human rights um, to the country getting, how the country even got the rights and what a timely Netflix um, you know, documentary about FIFA and the corruption and everything. So it tells you that um, the World Cup in Qatar um, the World Cup in Qatar, a strange one, happening anyway, um, happening in November. We've now had a World Cup in November ever, and um, we're having one now um, in the middle of the season. Um, everything is just everything is just strange, weird. And um, on this part of the world, I mean, in Africa, uh, many understand why the issues of, you know, um, LGBT is not really... Um, uh, many of their business on this part of the world because remember in many countries in Africa um, sex, sex marriage is forbidden so some of them understand um, the culture of Qatar doing that and um, on the part of alcohol as well um, people here will easily tell you if the rules of the country forbids alcohol then you, you, need, to, you need to close your fridge and your bottle and just stay away from alcohol in that country because the rules are the rules because America has got its own rules United Kingdom's got its own rules. Every country's got their own rules. So we have to respect that. But this is football. Football sees no color, sees no, um, you know, there's no discrimination in football. They call it the beautiful game. Unfortunately, from the awarding of, from the awarding of the hosting right to Qatar to the situation right now, everything is just unusual. And that's why I said, I woke up in November in the Middle East, in an Arab nation, with everyone complaining and shouting. Just a strange time. Strange time, really. It is a strange time. Let's go to the football then. And I wanted to ask you about Cameroon first. Um, Rig Rigobert Song, I, I think a lot of, uh, certainly a lot of Liverpool supporters will remember him. And we remember him from the World Cup. Uh, mm. a, ver a very kind of, I suppose, uh, memorable player. Um, how is he as mm. a coach? Uh, he's loved in Cameroon. Is, is loved in Cameroon, one of the most top players in the country, is pretty, very respected. As a manager, he hasn't, I think in the beginning, he earned the fact that, you know, his success on the pitch translated to people adoring him, you know, applauding him and supporting him. But as a manager, um, since March, um, I mean, it's been a struggle. He hasn't really convinced a lot of people. Um, critics are saying he's not ready for the big time. He hasn't really coached at the highest level. He's only managed the youth setup and, of course, the local um, Cameroon national side as well. So many haven't really seen many haven't really seen a lot from Rigo Betsen to actually decide that he's the man for the job. And the way the team has actually um, prepared for the World Cup itself, a lot of people are not convinced. Um, those two um, friendly games in September and the recent one against Jamaica at home hasn't really convinced his biggest critics that he's the man for the job. He has the support of Samuel Eto'o, the president of the Cameroonian Football Federation, four-time African footballer of the year, the legend, who practically and picked him and gave him the job. He has the support of Eto'o. Once you have the support of Eto'o, you have the support of the president, it doesn't matter what the fans are thinking. Oh, <laughs> really? Wow. I suppose, I mean, Eto'o must uh, wield a lot of power. So you don't expect much then from Cameroon? Um, not really. Um, I think they are in a very difficult group. Um, they are in the same group as... Um, they're in the same group as Brazil. So yeah. you think that, and if you look at if you look at the record of Cameroon as well, um, they impressed in their um, first two World Cups, you know, um, on beating in 1982, um, then becoming the first African side to reach the quarterfinals in 1990. But since those early stage, Cameroon have not won a game. They've only won one match at the World Cup in 15 matches. So it's a very gloom um, appearance when you look at that. And when when you look at the last time they won, they beat Saudi Arabia. I mean, that was in 2002 with um, Samuel Eto'o scoring there. So it tells you a lot has changed from then. And then you look at um, the teams they are going to play, Switzerland, Serbia, and Brazil. 
on paper, you think they should they should fight for a second spot alongside Brazil, one of the pre tournament favorites. But we are talking about Cameroon here. They haven't looked um, like a side in preparation. They didn't look too convincing in their preparation games. The manager doesn't seem to have his first team yet. He's still trying to patch and manage things. I think it will be very difficult for Cameroon. History-wise, the fixtures, um, and of course, form-wise, I think Cameroon will struggle like this World Cup. We've seen greater generation of Cameroon um, um, players going to the World Cup. This is one of the weakest ever in the history of Cameroonian football. Interesting. Uh, uh, Alawashina, I, I suppose I wanted to ask you about Senegal because I think people have a basic understanding that if Mane is fit... <laughs> they'll do well. If he's not, they might struggle. Is is it as clear-cut as that? Um, because he's the talisman. Sadio Mane is the angel room of the, of the Senegalese side. I mean, the captain is Khalidou Koulibaly of Chelsea. A lot of people know him. In midfield, they've got Ismail Age. They've got Sheku Kuyate. Some of the... Um, they've got Ismail Astar going forward. Uh, Bula Yedia, who plays in Salalitana from Villarreal, on loan from Villarreal. They've got fantastic players all around when you look. But... Right. In Sadio Mane, they have what they call their own Neymar, possibly. Their own Messi, maybe. And of course, what else can you say about the man who practically scored the important goal that got Senegal their first African Cup of Nations title? And of course, he scored the goal that sent them to the World Cup, the last penalty kick that sent them to the World Cup. It tells you the kind of man that he is. He's the heart and soul of the Senegalese team. Senegal are better and bigger and, of course, more dangerous with Mane in the team than when Mane is not there. I mean, there's this aura that he carries when he goes on the pitch. It's like when Messi is playing, you know quite well that there's a player that can actually change the course of a game in any football match. So that is what Mane brings to Senegal. He's loved in his country. He's at all. If he contests for the president of Senegal tomorrow, you win because they love him in Senegal, a lovable guy and all that. Unfortunately, that injury has really cast a lot of um, question mark on Senegal's ability to actually um, do well. But I still think without money, they can get the job done. I mean, they are in a group with Netherlands. Um, people expect them to go with the Netherlands. Um, Ecuador and um, Qatar, the host. Well, with due respect to them, they are not as strong as the other two teams from Africa and from Europe. Um, Kalidou uh, Koulibaly, I read some quotes from the captain uh, on Al Jazeera and he seems quite uh, bullish about their prospects, but they haven't been great. Am I right in saying they haven't been great since they won the African Cup of Nations? So are, are, mm. they, are they going in with, the, with, some, with some problems? Apart from that. No, I think, no, I think the, the, the biggest thing is when you look at the five African teams going to the tournament, they have Africa's brightest chance of going far in this tournament. Okay. And Lidu Kalibali has been talking. Some of those interviews came um, before Mane's injury and, of course, before some of their two matches. I also got an opportunity to, to write that story for Al Jazeera. And he did say that every African team go to the World Cup wanting to break the African ceiling, which is the quarterfinals. Why? He said England don't go to the World Cup to say we want to get to the quarterfinals. Portugal... You know, Germany and the rest, they don't go there saying we want to make the last eight. So Africa should get off that mindset. He will be going to the World Cup to win it because if you don't think you can win it, then you have no business traveling to the World Cup in Qatar. So that has always been his point. And that's, that I think is something that he's been saying. And I think that's clearly what he's saying. Do they, do they, do they have the ability to win the World Cup? I think that's punching above your weight, in my opinion. But in, in, in the recent sense of it, no one thought. Cameroon was going to get to the last eight in 1990, and no one expected Senegal to get to the quarterfinals in 2002. So sometimes, because this World Cup is happening in the middle of the season, things can go awfully wrong for the for the favorites, and some of the you know um, little teams can just so-called little teams can just take over and um, create a bit of surprise or upset. Um, I suppose this is again a very simplistic take, but. Um, is Ghana, the fact that they've been drawn in a group with Uruguay again, is there is there still a scar on the psyche of Guinean football about what happened in 2010? Or will this game, it won't be a grudge match, it'll be just another game? Do, don't believe anything you read. Ghanaians are saying this is a revenge game for them. Okay. Remember, right. Luis, Luis, Luis Suarez is still in the team. 
That's, that's if Luis Suarez wasn't there, if Luis Suarez <laughs> wasn't there, maybe the plot might change. But for Ghanaians, um, some of their former players who played in the 2010 edition are saying the players should get their minds off it. They shouldn't talk about being revenge and all that. But mm. Ghana look back at 2010 as the biggest opportunity lost for them. They felt that was an opportunity to get to the semi-finals, and now they will be facing Uruguay again. They don't care. I remember they also faced Portugal before at the World Cup. So for Ghana, um, the game against Uruguay is as important as the one against um, Portugal. But the problem they are having right now is they don't really have a team. I mean, everyone talks about Ghana, Black Stars. Um, they've been they've been struggling from the Afcon in 2000 and um, early this year. Their worst Afcon performance in about 40 years when they couldn't even come out of the group. So, you know, change of manager, bringing a new manager. This new manager is just, um, a lot of people say he's, having the, he's going to the World Cup on trial because he hasn't really managed at this level before. They were fortuitous against Nigeria. They picked up the World Cup to get a, a game Nigeria shouldn't have lost but because they had the quality, they had everything. But Ghana edged them, um, you know, 1 1, a way go through. They are at the World Cup, but nothing has changed since picking that World Cup ticket. Still a weak Ghana side. They've drafted in all these diaspora players, Tariq um, from Brighton. They brought in Aki Williams from um, from Spain, um, an athletic Bilbao. They brought in a couple of other players. The Southampton defender is there. But still, they are yet to gel as the Black Stars. There, there's, there's speculation and, of course, rumours are rife that the camp, the camp is divided. Some players feel... There are players who are coming in to profit and benefit from our struggles and those who have actually fought the battle to get Ghana to the World Cup. That is not the ideal way to prepare for the World Cup. Coupled with the fact that the manager's future is uncertain. Is it with Borussia Dortmund or is it with Ghana? So it's just a whole lot of mess and it's not the best of jello fries for Ghana to take to the World Cup. No. Is, is there controversy? In, like how, is, how is someone like Nyaki Williams viewed? Like, is he seen as a mercenary? Um... Well, it's 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 hard to tell, but he himself has, in Aki Williams came out to say he's gotten you know enough enough support from the players. They welcome him um, with open arms. They've been very warm and receptive towards him. He's begin to feel very Ghanaian in the dressing room because of the dancing and all that. <laughs> he has been the only one addressing that particular issue. That some people might think that I'm coming to take someone else's place, but that's not true. Because in the past, the reason why he stayed away was the fact that he didn't want to profit from someone else who had worked. He said now he was asked to come. And the decision to, to go to the World Cup wasn't easy to make. It was picked and selected by, um, by Ghana. He said he feels un it's unfortunate that everyone won't go mm -hmm. to the World Cup, but he's only um, a player who was selected and he wants to honor his grandfather by playing for Ghana at the World Cup. I don't feel like he is getting or feeling the heat as a mercenary. I think he just understands the fact that he's very aware of the situation. Some people are giving their all for Ghana to qualify. But then again, if you're good enough, then you can make your way to the World Cup. And I think Ghana wants experience. They want a player who can add quality to them. And that's why they are taking him. OK, let's round off with the, with the North African sides. Um, again, forgive my ignorance, but when I think of Moroccan football, Olawashina, I think of Youssef Chipo and Mustafa Hadji. And that, I mean, that's over 20, well over 20 years ago now. So what what is the state of Morocco and can they make a splash at the World Cup? I think Morocco just took the how not to go to the World Cup to another level oh. by sacking the manager two months to the World Cup, replacing the manager, bringing in a new manager, Hakim Ziyech, who didn't show any respect to anyone no. in the past, was drafted in. Akim Ziyech of Chelsea. Um, but then again, Wahid Regragi, the new manager, is done is achieved success on the continent wise with Widat Casablanca. They've replaced the manager. But in Sofian Buffard, they still have a player. Remember Sofian Buffard, former um, Southampton player. Um, he brings a lot of quality to the team. Um, Ashraf Hakimi with PSG is undoubtedly one of the finest defenders in world football. Yeah. So um, you know, they have Yusuf Nestri, um, who is also playing in La Liga with um with uh, Sevilla, I think. And then um, Romain says, um, says the former um, Wolves defender, Wolverhampton Wanderers defender. So I think they have a good squad. But the problem really with Morocco is um, they are the second best to um, to Senegal in terms of African teams going to the World Cup. 
they tend to promise so much, but then when they get to the World Cup, they fail to perform. The Atlas Lions, I don't think it will be an easy one for them. Um, I don't know. Um, they open up against Croatia, um, then they face Belgium and then Canada. On paper, that shouldn't be a difficult group. But for Morocco, we don't know what will happen. So I think for Regragi, it is how to manage the egos and the players and put them together to actually um, get themselves out of that group. Sure. Uh, managing ego is a big part of international football and football in general. At Tunisia, finally. Um, uh, uh, Tunisia opening... is another... <laughs> yeah, sorry? Yeah, so I was going to say, for about maybe 25, 30 minutes, maybe longer against England at the last World Cup, I was kind of impressed mm. by them. I thought they played some nice stuff. And then kind of just the power of England overtook them. So can we expect any better this time round? According to Wabi Kasri, um, one of the two captains alongside Yusuf Nsekni, he said they made a mistake against um, England at the World Cup. They switched up and left a player like Harry Kane all by himself. And that's how they lost. He said they would take that lesson to this new World Cup. But we are talking about um, we are talking about a team that has only won two World Cup matches at six appearances. So the, the, the stakes are high. Their last victory was against Panama in 2018. They've got a, a lot of good players. The money guy is inexperienced at this level as well. Tunisia, the Cate Eagles, 2004 African champions. I, I think they, they can promise a lot, but they are also in a very difficult group. They have to face France. Um, yeah. And then they, they also have Australia and Denmark, who also show at the last Euros that they are a very, very strong team. So I think for Tunisia, they've never gotten out of the group in their World Cup history. They said they are aiming to come out of the group and make the round of 16 for the first time. Are they good enough? I don't think so. Um, will it be the year of the Carthage Eagles? I think they will have to fly and spread their wings properly to actually get out of that group because against France, it will be very, very difficult because France can easily clip their wings and make life difficult for them. So I think um, the two African teams, for me, going to the World Cup, that, that I think my good as far as the um, round of 16 will be Senegal and Morocco. I think... Um, Ghana, Tunisia, and Cameroon are only going there to complete the numbers. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, one thing before we let you go on, you've been very generous with your time. No Nigeria. No Super <laughs> Eagles. Um, feels strange, doesn't it? I feel strange, but they don't deserve to be there. That's why they, they, they are not there. I think um, against Ghana, they should go to the World Cup. They had every opportunity. They had every chance. I think um, the arrogance, sometimes Nigerians can be very arrogant, very loud and very cocky when it comes to football matches. They tend to think that, look, they are the giants of Africa. They've got the best kids. They've got the finest players. They've got everything. But failure to plan means planning to fail. So they don't deserve to be here because um, when you look across Europe, you find fantastic players. Poor um, decision in terms of the, having an interim manager who has nothing um, at stake and giving him the top job of qualifying you for the World Cup. The AFCON was an opportunity for you to understand that this man isn't going to take you anywhere. So they failed in terms of their managerial selection. They also failed in terms of how they plan for that World Cup. I think psychology, psychologically, mentally, and of course, in everything Nigerians do, I think this is a great lesson for them. They probably need to sit out this World Cup to understand that it's no longer business as usual. You don't walk over African teams Verbally, you have to go on the pitch and prove that you deserve to play at the World Cup. They don't deserve to be there. That's why they are not there. Aloshina, thank you so much for your time. That was that was excellent. We will be uh, we will be looking on at Senegal and Morocco, and we will see if your predictions come true. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me, and have a great time.